Welcome to the Biblical Languages Podcast, brought to you by Biblingo. We bring together the latest research in linguistics, language acquisition, and biblical studies to better understand the biblical languages and ultimately the biblical text. As always, this episode is brought to you by Biblingo, the premier solution for learning, maintaining, and enjoying the biblical languages. Visit biblingo.org to learn more and start your 10-day free trial. I am Kevin Grosso, your host for this episode, and I'm excited to talk with Dr. James Prothrow today about righteousness language in Paul. Welcome to the show, Jim. Thanks so much for having me, Kevin. So just a little bit about uh, Jim. He earned a master's degree in theology and in classical philology and completed a PhD at the University of Cambridge in 2017. He has worked in churches and parish ministries and as a professor and currently teaches at the Augustine Institute Graduate School of Theology in Colorado. He has written on Greek and on textual criticism, but his main areas of research are in the letters of Paul and in methods of interpretation and biblical theology. His books reflect these interests. He is the author of both Judge and Justifier, Biblical Legal Language in the Act of Justifying in Paul, published in 2018, and that's the one we're going to focus on today. Um, the Apostle Paul and His Letters, an introduction, 2021, and a forthcoming volume on Paul's theology of justification and salvation called A Pauline Theology of Justification, Forgiveness, Friendship, and Life with God. And hopefully we will hear some of the ideas from that book, um, which is coming out next year. Do you know when next year? Uh, should be yeah, should be this winter. So uh, hopefully beginning of 2023. Oh, uh, great! So I've already got uh, uh, proofs, and we're asking people for blurbs already. So awesome. we don't have a cover yet, though. <laughs> awesome. That that that's not important, right? What, what matters is the inside. <laughs> um. So so reflecting his interest in interpretation and biblical theology, he is currently finishing a biblical theology of confession and repentance for Baker Academic and is editing a collection of essays forthcoming with Erdman's entitled The Future of Catholic Biblical Interpretation, Lagrange and Beyond. So like I said, we're going to be talking about um, focusing on his um, both Judge and Justifier, which is a book, um, which is really his dissertation, right? Pretty much the same thing. Um, Yeah, I I think I added six sentences from the dissertation to make it the book it was it was really it was really nice to have it work out that way (laughs) yeah yeah for sure um so obviously when you talk about justification right there's um there's a lot of different things you could talk about one of the things you do um that i found that was really helpful was just you start out by just saying okay here's all the players (laughs) you know and and that um if you're reading through the literature on justification um it can be a little bit dizzying when you know someone is writing from from a particular perspective and they just assume that everyone knows <laughs> all the perspectives um so can you just give us sort of an overview of the various scholarly perspectives on justification um and i'm thinking particularly of like traditional protestant um like the new perspective tr- traditional catholic and apocalyptic are the four main it, is what i would say and it i think is reflected in your book yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, it's it's um, uh, it's funny as you as you said. On the one hand, it can be kind of dizzying to think about all the different kind of versions of this, and at the other hand, you, it, it's easy to assume like, well, everybody knows the kind of the one. Haven't we figured this out yet? <laughs> uh, and I remember when I first got to um, Cambridge, uh, and I was I had a desk at, at Tyndale House, and, and some of the listeners may know where that is. Just a, a library um, there and a research hub. And uh, I told some of the people, you know, they were like, oh, hi, you know, what's your, because when you're a PhD student at the University of Cambridge at Tyndale House, you're the lowest person on the totem pole because everybody else is there to work on their like eighth book. And you're like, hi, please, please let me sit at the table. Um, <laughs> but I, I showed up and they said, what are you working on? And I said, oh, justification and Paul and and um, uh, at least two different senior people said, who let you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Right. Uh, and then other people were like, well, "Why are you doing that again? Is that like this, this? That's the dumbest thing in the world." Anyway, uh, but by the by the time I had actually finished it, they were all like, "Oh, this is actually important." This, you know, I, you know, I hadn't hadn't thought of this, but um, but cl- cl- getting clarity on on what the heck is going on is 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 thing number one. Um, and I, I started in 2013, um, and so uh, all of the 2009 books were kind of still the rage. Um, so thinking of N.T. Wright's justification book where he's kind of responding to John Piper, um, 
which was uh, which was big for anybody who likes writing. It was really big in the evangelical world. Um, Douglas Campbell, who had a big apocalyptic one and his own sort of shtick. Um, and then Michael Gorman had also written his book on justification as theosis, right? And, and transformation um, uh, uh, into immortality and righteousness and everything like that. So they were, they, that was, that was kind of what was going on. Um, but I think you're, you're right that largely those are still the kind of main camps, um, the, the sort of, um, uh, uh, okay, I won't, I won't go down that, but, but anyway, I think they're still basically the main camps. Um, so, um, my, my stuff sort of asked the question, um, like what, what is the, what is, what does the language mean? What is particularly the act of justifying? We've got lots of kind of righteousness, justice language in Paul. What does justifying refer to? Um, what, what does it kind of bring to our imaginations? Why does Paul use this word as opposed to another word, right? When he's got so many different words to talk about what happens in the saving event. Um, and, uh, uh, there's lots of people who will agree that the verb justify is legal in some way. Some people who don't, but, but most people will agree that it is. But the next question is kind of like, what, what, what does that look like? Um, so uh, and, and of course, all the different camps have lots of differences, as you know very well. Um, but but to give kind of a basic sketch uh, of some different options, um, if you have the kind of a traditional Protestant usually focuses on the image of acquittal, and usually so so and, and that translates with sins, right? To to forgiveness of sins, right? God declares you righteous even though you're guilty, um, and so now you're released from punishment, right? And you're sort of let off, right? Um, some translations will translate the verb as uh, God clearing somebody's name. So the, the the Revised English Bible does that once in Isaiah. Uh, that God has sort of cleared their name. Um, uh, and the uh, the image here is often not only but but often something a little bit more like a like a United States um, criminal court, right? Your, your crime is just sort of objective. You're accused of a crime and you're in fact guilty of it. And you've kind of been brought before the bar, right? And the judge is going to make a decision about what to what verdict to render. Um, and of course, Christ comes, right? And so the verdict can be rendered not guilty instead of guilty, which would otherwise be the, the case and is otherwise true of you. Um, but it's sort of focused on past behavior and the uh, justifying is this judge's verdict or declaration, um, and then sometimes that gets that gets spun out into different types of of theological readings, um, but that's kind of the the, the main core um, of this kind of type. Um, so that's the just traditional Protestant. It kind of yeah, for for lack of a for lack of a more nuanced term, right? right? It's easy to it's more helpful to oversimplify at the beginning and then complicate, right? Um, uh, and then so uh, another. Um, uh, another view, right, um, uh, would come with N.T. Wright, right, in his really influential book in 2009, especially, um, where he says, well, it, it, the, the, the problem setting for justification isn't, am I guilty and how can I be forgiven? Uh, he says the problem setting is, uh, am I among the righteous people, right? So righteousness becomes a sort of a term that identifies what group you're in before God, right? So the people in the covenant are the righteous. Sure, they sin sometimes, right? But they are the righteous as opposed to the wicked. And his argument is that there's no real such thing as a criminal court in ancient Israel, right? Where Paul's getting his metaphor. What you have is a judge always presiding over two people arguing with each other. So it's much more like a civil court. Right. So Jack over here says, says that, that Tommy stole my sheep. Tommy says, nah, -uh, right. And then it gets brought before the judge and the judge has to decide which one to vindicate and which one to condemn. Uh, and so he's going to, God is always going to vindicate the righteous, which in the old Testament generally, right. Typically is Israel. And then Wright says, right. This comes in in Paul's day, right. With the debate about who is Israel, right. Who's in the covenant, Jews or Gentiles, right? And so the, the new marker of the covenant is not circumcision, but faith. And God is going to vindicate, right? And declare righteous and sort of raise up and exalt the people who are in Christ, in the covenant, against the rest of the world at the last day. And so somebody to be justified, right? If a Gentile is justified, it means that God is sort of ahead of time indicating or declaring that you're righteous 
That is to say, not righteous like let off the hook or forgiven necessarily, although he, he brings that in in a later book. Not necessarily uh, righteous in the sense of, or not guilty in the sense of we're going to spare the punishment, although that's not untrue, right? But that the primary kind of image here is you're righteous, meaning you're part of the covenant group, right? That will be vindicated, right? You're sort of by definition righteous or the righteous because you're Israel. Um, the traditional Catholic one, and, and Gorman's book, Gorman isn't a, a Catholic himself, um, but he uh, he reads in ways that are um, uh, very similar to lots of traditional patristic and then uh, later medieval um, Catholic positions. And that this is the, the transformation, right, by being joined to Christ, right? So uh, grace, um, which from especially Augustine on is sort of identified with the gift of the Holy Spirit, although they can talk about different kinds of grace, right, that work in you, that is to say different kinds of things the Spirit is doing, um, uh, that receiving the Holy Spirit and participating in Christ, right, brings about a transformation uh, in you morally, right, um, and at the end of it, it will bring about a transformation in you physically when you're actually raised incorruptible. Um, and so here, the, the, the setting is, right, I'm, I'm, it's not my past guilt as much as it is my fallenness as a human, right? The fact that I'm now mortal, corruptible, subject to the flesh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not present of, sin. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Fallen into sin, right? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and so, right, um, so being justified, right, and because it's happening through this kind of process um, is about, right, being transformed and conformed to the new Adam, and then this bleeds over for a lot of people into the way that they handle the verb justify. Um, so uh, uh, you can see this already in some patristic authors who are reading in Greek. You can see it definitely in, in, in Augustine, right? Um, uh, that justifying is God, right? Making you righteous by grace and righteous in a sort of moral transformation sense. Um, and that, uh, I just to go back to the patristics, I mean, that would. I mean, it's been a long time, honestly, since I've read. I mean, Augustine, to me, when I read them, I, him, I was like, oh, he's like taking it totally differently than, you know, the, the traditional Protestant interpretation. Um, but so are, do, you know, Origen, like, does he take it the same way? And, um, you know, some of the early Greek speakers? Yeah, so early. So I... Um, uh... Sorry if the, I know this is this is like no, kind no, of no. off the cuff and no, no, I'm, you're not, good. I've, I've I'm just, not sure how much it's your field, but it's not as much mine. So no, so so um, uh, I mean, on the one hand, as a as a Catholic reader, I'm always reading the fathers, right? Right. Uh, uh, but then also, um, and we all uh, should be really. But. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. I just I just mean to say, you know, I, I um, you're supposed to more. Yeah, it's supposed to be. <laughs> um, but but out of it's out of that that I that makes me want to read it. Um, uh, but also, um, uh, when I was doing my dissertation work, right, I, I, I looked really hard. I, I prepared an article on on justifying in the first two or three centuries in Greek, um, and never ended up writing it up because, uh, well, a lot of things happened. But um, uh, what you see, especially in the first century or two after, well, the second century and then into the third. Uh, is you see people still using justify in regular legal senses, which, which we'll come to, right, um, in ways that sort of continue that, that usage uh, from the Septuagint and Paul. But then they're also using it to mean something that kind of refers more to what we might call salvation, right? They're using the, the verb to indicate the kind of whole thing that's going on. Um, and, and in that sense, right, they, they're, they're doing very much what Gorman or a traditional Catholic would do, right, to read the verb just to mean make righteous, right? Not make righteous in the mind of the judge, not make righteous by sort of setting them right, whereas they've been wronged by an enemy or something like that, um, but make righteous it, indicating that internal transformation by the Holy Spirit and through participation. Um, uh, and I, I view that we'll, we'll get to this later. I'm sure when we talk about kind of like meaning and what I think is going on. Um, but I view that to be a very natural and not totally wrong way of reading Paul, right? I think that they're using the verb, they're developing the verb because they're using it, right? They're not just being exegetes and saying in Romans three, it means this, right? They're right. Not, right. They're not, they're not doing that. Right? They're using the verb because this is now part of their own language. Um, so I view this as a natural liturgical development as it's associated with 
um, uh, baptism and as it starts to be used as a kind of like umbrella term for all of salvation. And, and honestly, that's one of the troubles that comes out in all the different conversations when you start to talk to somebody about justification in Paul is you have to see really clearly what do you mean justification? Do you mean all of his soteriology, right? Yeah. In, in a classic kind of Augustinian way or a Lutheran way, right? Where that's the that's the word that we're using, right? Aquinas is the same thing. Or do you mean we're tracing really carefully a, a particular image that's grammaticalized by this particular verb, right? At, among many other visions for salvation that are happening in Paul. Um, are you just talking about this verb, right? Even when it's not, in a salvific context, right? What are you talking about? Um, and so th- this is this is why my uh, 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 my dissertation actually doesn't have the word justification in the title. It has justifier, <laughs> and it has act of justifying, but it doesn't have theology of justification. That's what the new book has, right? Where I try to do more stuff. Um, uh, but in the first book, it's very, very focused on the verb um, and the kind of image that's indicated by this particular verb. Um, without saying, now we're going to put everything together and talk about how Paul thinks God makes humans his friends, right? Um. <laughs> right. Well, and I think that's part of the problem with the whole discussion. I mean, on a, a a lot of lay people, you know, if you talk to them like about justification, it's it is synonymous with salvation, you know. And and the the reality is is that just the words are different, right? So so even if there's overlap, right? They're not they're not the same, right? And and so the the problem with a lot of the discussion is it once you start talking once you start nuancing justification some people think that you're now getting rid of you're talking you're talking about salvation you know you're, now you're talking about salvation by whatever <laughs> right and people have all of these you know ideas about what salvation should be um you know what it should and should not include right um but justification need not include those things right and from a just from a, you know, exegetical standpoint, they can just be used slightly differently, and and therefore have different sorts of conditions, right, and all, all kinds of different things, and they might entail one another, right. So if you are justified, you are necessarily saved, or if you're saved, you're necessarily justified, but that doesn't mean they're the same thing. Um, so so yeah, I mean, I think I think it's it's very helpful, um, that you 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 know do avoid that language, <laughs> just because it is it's confusing for a lot of people. Uh, honestly, I feel I feel like I'm beating against a wall half the time, though, because, <laughs> because because everybody's like, oh, but so you talked about this. Yeah, that's in there. But what about the inheritance? And I'm like, there's a different word for that. Right, that's right, right. Part of it's irrelevant. <laughs> it's just not it's just not that word. I'm talking about this word. It, <laughs> right, right. No, no. Talk about that word. I would do this other thing. Um, right, right. Yeah. OK, OK. So so we've got these three traditional Protestant acquittal you know, standing before court, he declares you innocent um, or acquitted. And the new, new, uh, the the new perspective or that we're associating with right, really, um, we bring in the idea of covenant. And then the traditional Catholic is, you know, make righteous is, is how it's often translated, right? As in like make morally righteous. Um, and then we have apocalyptic, which is its own animal <laughs> that, Again, it's like, you know, kind of rejects everything. Uh, so, so tell us about, you know, what these people are doing. Yeah. So um, uh, one of the ways that uh, going back to the make righteous thing. So one, one of the ways in which, say, um, Michael Gorman is able to, to, to sort of not just say Paul's theology is about ultimately transforming you, but that the word justify is about that, is that he says that Paul is sort of co-opting this Jewish view, right? That use this kind of language about God as a judge, and he's using it in a participation kind of context that then sort of redefines the word, right? By 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 associating it with something new, right? In, in the new covenant with the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, uh, the apocalyptic school, he's, he's, he's actually borrowing that move from one of the people in the apocalyptic school in an article written by... Um, uh, Martinez de Boer, and the apocalyptic school usually, right, generally, not not all of them, but usually looks at the verb justify and says, yeah, it looks like a judgy thing, right? This normal context, but if you look through, right, it's not just you and the judge sitting there together and Paul, right? You've got all these other enemies, right? And justifying 
sounds a lot more like delivering somebody from sin, death, and the devil, right? Not from their past guilt, but it's God stepping in to right rescue you from these people and sort of powerfully defeating them. And so oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, uh, people will use the word rectification for this instead of justify, which sounds more sort of just juridical, right? At least in our in our minds, it does, right? Um, so they'll say it means rectify, like set things right, right? The cosmos has gone wrong, is is invaded and, and run by these evil powers. And so in the inbreaking of God and Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God into the world, God is setting right what's gone wrong. And one of the ways in which things have gone wrong, right, is that people have become enslaved, human creatures who've made for life, right, have become enslaved to sin, death, um, uh, and the powers of the, the cosmos. Uh, and so God is sort of delivering you from that. So it's a very kind of uh, militaristic imagery, right? A lot of battlefield imagery uh, that that's there. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that's hard about all this, again, is disambiguating, right, what we're talking about and then what we're saying and not saying, because um, does it seem like in Paul, God forgives your past sins, right? Acquittal. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> he doesn't use the the verb forgive a whole lot, but that that seems to be happening, right? We were God's enemies, now we're His friends. Um, uh, is there is there a sort of people group that God is going to vindicate, right? Well, it, yeah, and it seems like in Christ is the right word for that, and and these are people who are right, faithful and following God, um, ideally. Um, so like, is, is that going to happen right in, in, in Wright's view of coming into the covenant and then being vindicated at the end? Well, uh, uh, yeah, right. Uh, that seems to be happening as well, right? Rom- Romans eight, right. Who can be against this? If God is for us, right. He'll give us everything because he's given us Christ. Um, uh, I, th- I think, right. does, does Paul have right transformation happening, right. Uh, both morally now in us, right. Where God is at work, as he says in Philippians to will and to do so that you, work out your salvation, right? With him working in you. Yeah. Right. He says things like that. And you're going to be transformed ultimately at the end, right. In conformity to Christ when you're raised incorruptible. So that's there. Right. And is the battlefield imagery there, right? Is God rescuing you from the power of sin? Yeah, boy. Uh, (laughs) um, Right. These are, these are all there. Um, But then the question becomes, I, I think twofold, right? Which, what parts of this does justify refer to, right? That particular language among all the other language that he has. And then also, right, what do you take to be the sort of core of salvation? Because sometimes when justification is used as the kind of umbrella term, sometimes when people do that, that means that they bring everything in Paul under the word justification. Um, so if you read, uh, for instance, the catechism of the Catholic church, right. Kind of following Augustine and Aquinas, um, they, their section on soteriology and grace is titled justification. And then it has like justification is, and then you just have kind of all of this stuff under it, right. From forgiveness to reconciliation, to empowerment by the Holy spirit, to the final judgment and right. All of it's there. Um, on the other hand, other people will say, uh, see, justification is the salvation word. Therefore, we're going to focus really narrowly just on this, uh, on, on, on to sort of narrow down what we can get justified to mean. And then that's what salvation is about. And everything else is secondary, right? Right. So, right. Once we figured out that, uh, oh, it's, it's legal. So it's just about forgiveness, right? Or the verdict that the judge issues, then all the transformation stuff is there, but it has to be somewhere else or being delivered from sin is there, but it's not actually what saves you. Right. Or something like that. And that is the, you know, traditional more Protestant kind of thing where you're saying, okay, justification equals salvation, justification equals forgiveness. Therefore salvation equals forgiveness. And the transformation thing, you know, I don't know how to fit it in. Right? Like that's kind of the that's uh, that's an oversimplification and really not fair. But but the that, that is how some people you know read it, right? And and that's that's um you know again most scholars are are way more nuanced than that, right? Um, but 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 that is why it matters, you know, sort of like on the street, you know. Um, and the, the same thing on the other side, you know, if you if you make justification, I I, I have always when I have um you know, heard Catholics and Protestants talk about this, I, it, it is often that they are just talking past each other because they're just talking about two different things. 
you know, they're using the same language and they're just like, they're, they're, they haven't started out by defining their terms. And so it, it ends up being like, okay, you guys just need to, <laughs> you need to back up, you know, um, because you're, you're, you're talking about, um, yeah, just different, you're using the same language for different categories is, is a lot of times the issue. Not always. Of course, there are real differences. Um, but no, you're, you're, you're right. It's hard, it's hard to even start the conversation well when, when everybody thinks you're talking about something that you're not talking about. <laughs> right, right, right. So, so this, is, this is really helpful. So, so given these categories, right? So, so just go, zooming in on, on your work now, um, I'm tempted to ask you about, you know, obviously the title of your, your next book, you have forgiveness, friendship, and life with God as as the subtitle, right, of your theology of justification. Um, so maybe we'll, we will get to that because I, the way I'm reading you is um, forgiveness is a big part of um, the verb, if not the main part. Um, but but we can maybe we could just get into that in a minute um, once we explain where you're coming from. Um, so 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 let's 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 just talk about what are we actually doing with in Greek. Um, so you say in on page thirty six. So, so you focus on the verb, right? Dikaio, um, and you mention. I don't know if I don't think you actually use this word like a deadjectival verb, right? But this is part of the um, the issue with the verb. So, like you have a you have a root. The root is dik, and then dikaios is the adjective, um, and then the the verb seems to be built off of that adjective, right? So, so what does that tell us about the verb, if anything? Um, and and why do you choose to focus on the verb in in general? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so you're you're, to- you're totally right. I mean, of course you are because you're you know good at this. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but but uh, the 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 kind of root of the whole thing is 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 dikai and then dikaios or dikaios. Um, I apologize. I'm going to sound weird because I learned on Erasmian pronunciation. Oh. And then linguistics Encyclopedia asked me to do a bunch of entries on phonology. And now I have to put my mouth where my money is. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, so I, I always feel bad because whenever I, I, I just so, I, the, the other pronunciation is so ingrained in me that I can't, I mean, I can, I can switch, you know, but, but I just talk in Greek when, when I'm like that. I'm like, oh, I, so no one's understanding me. Um, I know. No, I, I the and the thing that kills me is I, I I do a lot on at the beginning for my students in phonology, like because I think it's helpful to understand like the fact that the N is pronounced more with the tongue onto the teeth makes sense of why nu and sigma don't get along, you know? Right. Um, uh, anyway, um, so I think it's really important to do, but it's it, and I can read whole sentences in my sort of reconstructed Koine, and it's fine, and I think it's beautiful, and it sounds like a real language, but I can't do the charts. <laughs> yeah. I cannot say logos, logu, logo, logon, lagu, logon, logus. I can't. I I can't. Or like graphe, grapheis, graphe, graphane, graphe. Graphone, graphase, <laughs> yeah. graphos. I can't do it. Um, uh, I, so I'm always standing up there going, just going, just memorize it this way and then read it the other way if you want. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just, I, it's so ingrained. Um, but in, anyway, so so dikaios or dikaios right, is, it indicates uh, or is the, the root for the verb and then for most of our other language that we have, right? So we have um, dikaiosune, dikaiosune, right? Righteousness or justice. Um, which in its sort of asune kind of etymological origins, right, uh, in, indicates a kind of uh, a, a character or m- mode of being. Um, but it can also branch out to refer to acts that are considered righteous or things like that. The keoma, de um, is another one. And then, of course, the verb, right, de kaio, de kaio, um, which just means you know, kind of to, to dikaiosify, right, sort of in, in some way to cause something to be dikaios, to esteem something as dikaios, or you can be making it that way in your mind or treating it that way. Um, and that's the kind of basic etymological root. One of the problems, of course, is that um, uh, the, the ways in which verbs formed off of adjectives, deadjectival verbs like this, relate to the adjective uh, uh, varies, right, from, from thing to thing, depending on the way that they use the, the, the word. Um, so uh, examples of this, right? So 
kakao, right? It's from kakos, right? Which means bad, right? Evil, wicked, whatever, right? But kakao doesn't mean make bad. It usually means like treat badly, right? So you're being badly in doing the verb, right? Um, Axio is from axios, which means worthy, right? Um, fitting, right? You usually indicate something like esteeming or thinking something is worthy. It can mean making worthy. Uh, and then sometimes, right, it, the the uh, things that are derived etymologically from it, like axioma, right, where we get axiom from, means a question, right? <laughs> but somewhere deep down in the back, right, somebody has thought it worthy to ask this or thought something worthy of saying. But, it, but maybe that's how they worked it out in their head. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they just started using it that way, right? Who knows? So the the, the we want to make sure that we get the etymological connections between all of these words for justice and justify or righteousness and 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 rectify or whatever. And it's of course a problem in English because we have two different roots that we borrowed from different languages, right? The rect, right, right, right kind of thing from English and Germanic. And then the just used justify justice, right? That all come from from the Latin side, right? The Romance languages, and 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 they they and in English, we usually use justify, right? For the verb, we can use rectify, right? But it ha- doesn't have the same kind of broader sense, um, right? Rectify is something more kind of like limited in English. We use justify, whereas we use justice or righteousness or whatever. And some people will distinguish these things, but but in, in, in Greek, they all just sort of fit together. But that also doesn't mean they all mean exactly the same thing all the time. Um, right. And this is one of the reasons that I end up focusing on the verb when I'm trying to look for, right? Okay, what is justifying? There's a verbal noun, dikaiosis, dikaiosis, that means kind of like the process or the action of justifying, but it only shows up twice in Paul. It's really rare in the Septuagint. Like it's not a very common word. So it doesn't really help um, as a kind of main point of entry um, into asking about justification. A lot of people use righteousness of God, right? That phrase. Um, and there's so much debate about that. And I wrote, I did an SBL paper and I have a chapter in the new book on the righteousness of God. Um, and kind of unpacking it because the new book again is about more than just the act of justifying, right? But the kind of the broader theology. Um, uh, but it, it's it's important to remember that just because dikaio is formed off of dikaios doesn't mean that it therefore can mean kind of whatever we want it to once we've decided what we want dikaios to mean, right? Like if dikaios just means member of the covenant, therefore this means declare a member of the covenant, right? Or um, uh, Douglas Campbell, when he gets to the justifying language um, for his big kind of like liberation reading of justification in Paul says, yeah, see, it's a declaration like a judge, but but that doesn't have to mean, uh, you know, anything judicial. It doesn't have to come with its sort of like judicial, right? Legal conflict kind of background. This is just what anybody with executive power does. And so he has declared you, you know, kind of free from these things. Right. So it's now a, a, like it's, it's a declaration of amnesty. It's like, what? uh, So he's focused on declare and then sort of like brought that into a a different kind of context. Like a performative. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. And then um, somebody else will use dikaios and then go, ah, now see, I know that God's, God's righteousness in the Old Testament is having mercy. So justify basically just means to have mercy. It's like, mm, no, no, not, not, I mean, it is, but, but not for that reason and not, not that way exactly. Right. We, we really need to try to figure out what each of Paul's words is doing. Um, and I think it's important for understanding his theology. I mean, I think it's important for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, uh, for our scholarship, but we we if I can if I can if I can go more more theological for a second, right? We, we want to hear all of what he's saying, um, uh, especially for 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 Christian readers, believing readers, right? Um, I mean, good historians we want to hear all of what he's saying too, but believing reader, I want to hear everything he's talking about and everything he says is involved. So I want to try where I can to hear each bit clearly because each bit fits into the whole. Um, just like listening to a symphony, right? If you said, oh yeah, I can't really hear the oboe. So next time I go to the symphony, we should just fire the oboe player. <laughs> That's not actually how that works, right? Like the whole thing is impoverished by by missing one of the uh, uh, notes. 
even if it doesn't have the melody. Um, so anyway, sorry, that's a, I, I digress. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so then, well, okay, okay. Let, let, let's go to, let's go to your bilateral, trilateral contenders, because I think that will help people um, when we get into the actual text, figure out what you're doing. Um, so, so this is a big part of what you're doing. Maybe the kind of innovation, I think, in the sort of like, I, I mean, you know, with this kind of topic, <clears throat> you know, as, as your, um, you know, the reason why I think all of those people in Cambridge told you, like, why, why are you doing this, <laughs> right, is because people have done it before, but you, you approach it differently, right? So you approach um, this question, you know, of what does the verb mean by drawing on this background of the this bilateral and trilateral contentions, really, which is work that you're getting that's already been done, basically in Hebrew Bible about um, sort of what a court, you know, if we can use that term, um, would look like in the ancient world. So can you explain, like, what are these things, the bilateral and trilateral contentions, um, and how does this fit into your view of justification? And then we will come back to it when we look at actual, like, text from Paul. Yeah. So um, following the verb, um, I ended up looking through uh, stuff, places where I thought Paul was getting it from. Um, and very interestingly, um, if you read, um, uh, I've got a, I, I published an article on this because there wasn't enough space in the dissertation for it because we have a word limit um, back in 2016. Um, but if you just read through, uh, you know, the papyri and the TLG, looking at all the instances of, of Dikaio, um, uh, you find that in, in, in legal contexts in the Greco-Roman world uh, at Paul's time, uh, the synonym for justify was condemn. Right? So they're, presumably they're using it in some sort of sense to mean if you want to like back it up etymologically, right? like to sort of make justice happen for someone. But they used it basically just for people that they were sure were guilty, um, right. who were going down. Uh, it's a little bit like our English idiom, bring someone to justice. Right. Which you never mean like which 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 never really means like, oh, yeah, he was falsely accused, but tomorrow we'll bring him to justice. Right. You don't use that of people that you think are innocent. Right. And that right. they're going to get their rewards. Right. You use it of people you think are going to get their head cut off. Um, uh, so a- anyway, so 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 when I look at Paul and he uses justify as the opposite of condemn <laughs> very clearly, I go. All right. Well, I need to follow that verb back to some other place where he's getting this from, because Paul's pretty good at Greek. Uh, so presumably he's not going to make this kind of error. And there's enough evidence to show that that, that it is sort of um, strange, right? A strange usage. Um, but it turns out he's, you know, uh, and certainly he's quoting Romans 3, 4. He quotes Psalm 51, right, with a justify verb. Um, and he's getting this from the Septuagint and then from Jewish tradition. So I look back into... Um, uh, into justifying language in the Old Testament and then in Jewish tradition before Paul and Jewish Christian tradition. Um, and the there's two basic scenarios in which it is kind of framed a little bit differently against kind of what's going on and who the people who are justifying are. Um, and the, the basic core of it, um, you can find surrounded by lots of other legal vocabulary. Um, and this has all been done, as you said, right? This is all work that had been done for me in Hebrew Bible. But what I did is I traced it through to how it was translated into Greek. Um, and there's two basic kinds of scenarios of conflict that get laden with this legal language and where justify is a really important verb. Um, and in ways that, that I think bleed straight over into Paul. Um, the first one is, uh, they're both contentions, right? They're, they're both where people are arguing with each other about who's right, who's wrong, who's in the right, who's wrong. Um, uh, and the primary one is a, just a two-sided one, or I call it bilateral, um, where s- there's some wrong perceived or actual, and somebody comes to confront the other person over that, right? The, so somebody will come, usually angry, right? wrath, language. Right, against somebody that they're sure has done wrong to them, or often the word is sinned against them. Right. Like if Jack says, Hey, Tom stole my sheep. Tom, give me my sheep back. You stole my sheep. Right. So there's an accusation. Um, and the 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 kind of the the basic goal of this, right, is the same basic goal that you have if you're not a jerk, 
um, when when your friend or uh, your spouse or or somebody like that, right, does does something wrong, right, that is causing some sort of rupture in your relationship, right, you confront them about it, not to be mean or beat them down, but so that it can get fixed, right. So the goal of this is reconciliation, and what the person who is confronted with this accusation does, ideally, if they actually did the wrong thing, right, is confess ask for mercy, sometimes offer a gift of restitution, right? Like I still, yeah, I stole your sheep. Here's, you know, 20 shekels or here's another sheep, right? Or at least let me give you some mutton because I can't actually pay you back. And then it's in the other person's court, whether, you know, so to speak, it's a, actually, I should not use that word because that's a bad <laughs> court metaphor versus a, it's in the other person, it's the other person's prerogative, right? Who's in the right, whether they'll have mercy, whether they'll require more restitution, right? Et cetera. Now, this, these things can can come to blows because it's interpersonal, right? So if the one person says, is there in the wrong? And they're like, no, I won't confess, right? Get out of here, right? They might threaten them back. Um, uh, and then at that point, right, either it's going to come to some sort of fight, one person's going to drop their claim, or you're going to bring it before a judge or the elders at the gate or somebody else. Um, but justifying here, uh, we find relating both to the uh, to telling you who's in the right and then to people saying who else is in the right or thinking who else is in the right. So uh, Judah, right? Tamar breaks her vow to Judah, breaks what she has been told to do by the clan head um, and also is, is guilty of transgressing the marriage bed of the son that he's supposed to give her, right? When he founds out that she's pregnant, Right. Um, and not by his son because he ain't given her to her in marriage yet. And so they, right, he's, he's also the clan head, so he can impose a kind of uh, penalty on her because she's not confessing. Um, and he doesn't seem all that interested in it either. But then Tamar sends proof that actually Judah is the one who impregnated her. Ha ha. And then he says, she is justified over against me. Or maybe sometimes it's translated, she's righteous more than I am. But righteousness here has to do with who's right and who's wrong in this contention between the two people, right? Um, right. It doesn't necessarily say that Tamar is utterly innocent in everything that she's done, right? Um, it just means that in this particular, right, conflict, actually now Judah's going, oh, no, she's, she's, she's in the right. She's not totally wrong. Uh, right. she's, she's, she's not in the wrong against me. So Judah drops his claim and therefore also drops the penalty that he's, that he's put against her. Um, so when he says that of her and he says that she's justified, right, that has a, that, that's got a really huge role to play in their contention, um, one against the other, right, because it indicates him, right, dropping the suit. Uh, David and Saul, right, when David says, hey, you're persecuting me unjustly, Saul, but I have proof that I'm not trying to get you because I just cut this bit off of your robe while you were sleeping. I could have killed you, but I didn't. See, so stop trying to kill me. Because I'm not out to get you, right? I'm not your enemy, so you're you're wrong in being my enemy. And Saul, in one version of the story, says David is righteous as against me, right? He's in the right over against me. He's not saying that everything David has ever done is forgiven, right? Because they're going to have problems again, <laughs> right? Um, uh, but he's saying, right, relationally, right, and in this particular spat, David's in the right, I'm in the wrong. And in another version right? Saying that one person is righteous is the same thing as confessing sin. So in the other version of the David Saul spat about this, where the same thing happens again, instead of saying, you're righteous over against me, Saul says, I have sinned, right? And he drops his, drops his claim, right? He, he decides to go off, right? He's in the wrong, so he's not going to pursue David anymore. Um, so, so justifying, right, fits here in either uh, uh, the one party dropping their claims and saying, yeah, I'm in the wrong, you're in the right, right? Or the other party, right, can look at the one who's, uh, who's wronged them and say, I'll hold you to be in the right, even though you did this bad thing. And that means that they're going to show mercy. They're not going to pursue the penalty. And it, it, it involves a forgiveness of sins, right? So they're going to they're gonna pass over the, the wrong that's been done to them. And at the end of it, again, the goal is reconciliation, right? You've got peace restored between the two. Um, and again, some people may be happy to justify the person who's wronged them just because they asked. Some people might be happy to justify the person who's wronged them, but only if they pay them back, right? It's, but it's, it's up to the person who's in the right. 
Um, and the same thing gets used a lot of God in the prophets, right? I have a contention against my people, right? I have a legal case against my people. It gets called the prophetic lawsuit sometimes, although there's uh, you know, problems with that if you think about it in too much in our modern terms. As a lawsuit. Yeah, as a lawsuit. Right. right? Um, so, uh, so, anyway. yeah. So this is the bilateral. So, what? How do you distinguish that between, from the trilateral? That's right. So you have the the two sided one, and that's the core really of of all of the suits. Um, but in Israelite law, right? If you are sure that you're innocent and you're not going to, and you don't think you're going to get a fair hearing because the other person's more powerful than you, or they've got more powerful supporters, and they're not going to listen to you when you say, "Hey, you stole my sheep." Right? then you can bring it to a sovereign, right? Somebody who's outside the, the situation to decide it between the two of you. This is what you do when you've given up on reconciliation and you just want somebody to give you what's yours. Um, that's the judge's job is not to make them friends again, right? Or to restore that kind of order in the community and peace. But in this case, or like not willingly between the parties, in this case, what the judge or the elder at the gate or the king, when the king does this, their job is to punish the one that did wrong and lift up the one who did right. 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 And, and, and gotta decide that first. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, you know, one of the texts that comes to mind, First Kings 8, you know, when Solomon talks about, they had stick at Tzaddik, you know, like you, you need to justify the innocent or the the righteous or, you know, the just, <laughs> whatever term you want in there. But but the point being that, you know, in the judgment, you know, again, all of these terms, I, I, I hate to use all of these English words for, for, for all of these translations. But but the, the, the point is that, you know, you're going to come, two people are going to come before the king. Um, it's going to happen, you know, and and what God or I, th I think what Solomon, Solomon's praying Right, and he's he's praying about what should happen, and what should happen is that the the righteous judge or the king should should consider the tzaddik to be tzaddik, right? Um, oh, and, and instead of taking a bribe, right? And, and especially in these kinds of contexts, it's like okay, in in when you're in this scenario, um, you need to make sure that you, um consider right the person who is actually right right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so this would be this trilateral contention and obviously it's more complex than that um do you so let's let's well let's get into some actual texts from paul because i i think it would i think it will help people to see how these play out um can i, can I add a thing first before we jump into yeah, paul? yeah. just because i think it'll smooth the the transition yeah. um yeah. So and so with justifying with the word in the bilateral, it's this primarily relational thing. So when you if the person who's right justifies a person who is in the wrong, then that entails their forgiving and then it leads toward reconciliation. Right. Um, in the trilateral situation, right, where the judge's job is to or the king's job is to use their power to set things right. The justifying involves right the choice between the one or the other, right? They have to judge and justify. But the justifying also seems to involve the way that they use the word seems to also entail the kind of executive powerful action by which they vindicate one and put the other down. So it doesn't just refer to the decision that they render, either in their mind or in their with their mouth, right? It doesn't just indicate a verdict, it indicates the whole thing, right? If a judge justified somebody. Um, uh, who had been, uh, whose family had been murdered and didn't subject the other one to punishment. Right? They, they, they don't, they usually use like judge language for that, but they don't use justify. The justify sort of entails and involves the rest of the thing. And then when, when you bring this into to talking about God, which is where Paul doesn't just get it from old Ju uh, Israelite courtrooms or Judahite courtrooms, he gets it from people using this language of God. It gets, put into the present covenantal situation, right? Where God says, I have contention or I have a lawsuit against my people. Repent, right? Otherwise, the following things are going to happen where he's the He's the one in greater power and he's the one who's been wronged. Um, and he's asking them to confess, repent, do the thing that he asks them to do now, and he will forgive them, which can change, right? Sometimes it means stop oppressing the poor. And sometimes, right, with Jeremiah, it means 
surrender to Babylon. <laughs> Where right. God, God's like, that's what I'm telling you to do now. I don't care what I've told you to do before. That's the way that you obey me now is to surrender to Babylon. Don't make more sacrifices and say, oh God, now won't you deliver us from Babylon? That's not going to happen. <laughs> Just don't die. Right? <laughs> surrender to them and you won't die. Um, uh, uh, so you, 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 have, um, uh, you have it kind of in the present, but then they also start to talk about it as a kind of like universal contention and this is where they merge right because god is against all flesh right? jeremiah 25 the damascus document opens this way right god has a case or a lawsuit against all flesh in the world and he's coming to judge it but not everybody is going to be reconciled right not everybody is going to confess or submit to god but some people are so some people who confess and are forgiven then end up joining God's side and they become the soldiers on God's side with the angels in the final battle when God finally defeats evil, right? Um, because this is a, when it's God versus sin, this is a contention that's going to come to blows because evil in the world won't repent. Even if all the people do, right? God still has to crush the evil at the end of it. Um, uh, so there's, there's um, uh, so both of them kind of come together here, right? Because at the end, the righteous, who have confessed and been forgiven and reconciled to God, if that's what they needed, right? Which, well, according to Paul, everybody does. Then they will be vindicated at the end against everybody else, right? So you actually have a kind of two-stage thing of confessing and being reconciled to God, then living on God's side, and then at the end being uh, vindicated. Um, usually, most texts just has to do with right being part of his his army that defeats evil, and you're 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 part of that. Um, and then, of course, later on, it's going to get joined to resurrection, where the righteous will be resurrected, uh, will be raised to eternal life, and that's sort of part of their victory under God's victory. And and I and I think that kind of both of these things we end up seeing in Paul. Okay, now go. Sorry. So no. So I think this is it's really helpful. So so the one of the big points then is we need to figure out when Paul is saying what. I mean, and and or or. Another way to put it is, so part of the problem with the whole discussion, right, is, is that sometimes people put too much into one instance of the word. So they say, okay, well, it's the same word, so it should be the same meaning, <laughs> right? Which is just not, I mean, this is, that's just like not true, first of all. Um, Depends on what you mean by meaning. <laughs> yeah, sure, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, of course. I actually use meaning often much stricter. At the very, at the very least, um, interpretation right that you the same word isn't necessarily gonna have the same interpretation in every context right um <clears throat> i actually am, am much more inclined to say it, it'll probably have the same meaning uh, but the meaning is just more general than you think um usually but anyway the 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 question then is if if we have these different kinds of contexts right you know one where justification might lead to forgiveness right or one where justification might lead to, um, you know, someone being um, reconciled or even becoming on God's side, right, against evil. The, 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 I, the question is, in any given context, can the word mean, you know, coming on God's side, <laughs> right? Or does it mean um, God forgiving or acquitting um, and then... It is natural that the person would come. It is, you know, we can say an entailment, right? Even that that it the, the person would come to God's side, but it doesn't mean that the word is contributing that, right? In any given context. So, uh, so, so I think these are. So let's just go through, through, through an example. Um, you know, Romans two thirteen, right? Um, this is one that. Many people, especially Pauline scholars, just say, hey, Romans 2 doesn't exist in my world. I'm just going to go on to Romans 3. <laughs> you know, I actually think Romans 2 is like so important. Um, but but part of the problem has been that it like if you just read it at face value, it, I mean, it looks contradictory to what what Paul says elsewhere. Um, I mean, I, I don't think it is. But but Romans 2.13, right, says that the doers of the law will be justified, right? Dikaotheisetai. Um, so can you just explain your interpretation of of that verse um, in light of your contention scenarios? Or, or maybe I, I don't know if you think that 
there are some contexts in Paul where the contention scenarios are actually not as relevant. I mean, I think this is an obvious one where it would be. Um, but yeah, how, how do you read Romans 2.13? The doers of the law will be justified. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, uh, so I've got I've 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 got an article that's coming out on Romans two in CBQ. Um, we do way more than this, but anyways, you're I I've been I've been in that literature a lot lately, um, and so everything that you just now said, um, uh, the people can't see me on the video, but I was beating my breast while you were <laughs> talking. About it. Um, um, so it's true, uh, isn't it? I mean, people just no, Romans it's completely two. true. It's completely true. Yeah. Um, and even the people who say it's important and that it's not like unpauline usually don't come back to it very often. Right, right. They just um, ignore it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I, I think I think the first thing to say really shortly is um, so I, I I read Romans two uh, not as a way of sort of uh, showing how damnable the entire human race is, uh, so that Romans three can be good news. Um, I read Romans two as Paul pastorally addressing people who've got problems, right, and 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 uh, attacking presumption and the judgmentalism that goes along with it. So it's not just right somebody judging somebody else, but it's also somebody acting as though they're judging somebody else. We'll kind of get them off free at the judgment. Um, and so Paul says, right, in two twelve and thirteen or two thirteen, just right, it's not. It's not the hearers of the law who will be justified or, uh, or who will be righteous before God, but the doers of the law. So the contrast here is kind of binary. Are you do you just hear what God says to do, or do you or do you do it? Um, so it's, it's not it's not atomistic, um, as Ken, Kent Yinger had, had written in his um, book on judgment in Paul. Um, I, I think I, I also think it's really important, and I think it's realistic. Um, uh, so I th- if you look at Romans two twenty five to twenty nine, in the same context. He's talking about, again, people who don't have the law doing the law and judging the people who have the law but don't keep it. Um, uh, And I think this is a final judgment context. And I think he's talking about Christians who, by the Holy Spirit and by grace, have been doing and having the law fulfilled in them, as he says in Romans 8. Um, uh, So so you would take the doers of the law in Romans 2.13 as believers? uh, I I would take... I would take anybody who actually fits that description as a believer. I think in 2.13, he's just laying out the, like, he's just drawing a line in the sand, right? To say, right, you, you can't you can't just hear it and then esteem yourself to be great, right? You can't just be somebody who is like, oh, yeah, I'm in. Um, and so everything is fine. And yeah, I have the, right, either a Jew who says he has the word of God, um, which a lot of people take that to be particularly pointed against. Um, especially in view of the following verses, but it, it counts also for other people. I think, right? Paul will Paul will threaten uh, Gentiles who've been baptized, <laughs> uh, who are defecting from the sight of God with condemnation, as he does in Galatians. Right. Um, right. Uh, and First uh, Corinthians four uses a lot of similar language to Romans two, so I don't see a, any reason to take this as purely hypothetical. Right. Yeah. Uh, so j- for the record, I completely agree with you, and and I do think that I mean, even in Romans two, like fifteen and sixteen the law written on your heart like what is that other other than you know a reference to the new covenant <laughs> right i mean that's i i i, I don't really know how people have well I, I do know but but how people have just dismissed this but but it seems you know i pe- i think people in scholarship are actually are um generally agreeing more and more with this idea that romans 2 is referring to christians um this particular passage so so it, sorry this is just an aside Right, right. So, so, so then, what what does the verb actually mean here? Um, you, you, you also do have it. Um, I was just going to read the Greek really quick because I, you, you do have the adjective in the in the sentence before. So you have ugar hoi akroat akroatai nomu. So it is for it is not the hearers of the law, right? Dikayo dikayo para to teo, are righteous before God. Right, and then al hoi poietai nomu dikaute sontai. So the the doers of the law will be justified. So, so is is the dikaute sontai the same as dikayoi here? Um, and what what do those terms mean? Yeah, so I think I think close, right? So, um, uh, it, just in terms of word meaning, I mean, I I almost always gloss dikayao to mean um, uh, as uh, consider righteous or hold to be in the right. Um, 
and and then and then with lots of entailments depending on what kind of situation it's 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 set in right um in the life of the believer or in the kind of big contention that god has with sin my my reading here right is that this is a this is a reminder of the final judgment for people to tell them to to shape up and then of course in Romans three he's going to re- tell them about grace right how it works and then how it's delivered them from the sins that they're committing um, or might be committing um, and particularly with this Jew Gentile edge to sort of show the anthropological breadth of of justification and the work of Christ um, so in two thirteen right he, the first the first parallel is right it, the hearers of, it's not the hearers of the law that will be right? righteous before God or in God's sight, right? But the doers of the law will be justified. Um, and so for me, I, I take dikaiothesentai there, right? Will be justified um, to be a near parallel or a near synonym with righteous before God. That is to say, they will be held to be in the right by God. And in the contention scenario, um, uh, I, take, I take this to be, right, fronting the kind of the big ending Right. Um, so in God's contention against sin, so just moving to Paul here, right, and, and away from the um, uh, Jewish literature uh, or the Jewish literature that's not Christian also, because um, uh, Paul's also Jew, right? Um, right. Uh, you have to say that these days. <laughs> yeah, you do. And, and, and it is important. It, to be it, it, it is. It is important to say, yeah. actually. Um, so. Uh, 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 but um, right, so God has a God. God is against, and God's wrath is against all impiety and ungodliness. Right, Romans one eighteen. Um, God's against that, and that's what's going to be judged. Right, um, and there's things that happen in this life, right, that show that God has given people over into their sins, as He mentions in Romans one. Right, but the big, the big final day, right, He mentions in Romans two. Right, this is the final judgment. Um, that's just the logical. That's the sort of end point of the contention where God will defeat sin. And that involves judging all of the people to see who was on sin's side and who was on God's. Um, and so here there's a, right, there's the coming victory and the people who are with God will, this is in Romans two twenty seven right? The people who keep the law, right, will judge those who don't keep the law, law in Christ, et cetera, et cetera, right? But, but these are his words here in Romans 2. Um, uh, Romans or First Corinthians six, the, the the faithful will judge angels. They'll be part of God's executive act at the end. Um, and in Romans sixteen, right, God will crush Satan under your feet, right, y'all's feet, the church. Um, uh, so all of that is going to happen. But there's also this final judgment moment, right, where everybody's allegiance is sort of publicly shown. Um, what side they've been on, what they've done, right? It all kind of comes out. And the ones who have been on God's side and have followed him, not perfectly sinless, right? As we learned from all of his letters, right? Where he's talking to Christians and they're messing it up. Um, uh, but genuinely. Yeah, still. but genuinely still on God's side. They're, they're, they're believers and they're, and they're not presumptuous believers, um, uh, right? They're, they're trying to heed God um, and uh, be, as he says in Romans 6, right? Slaves of righteousness from the heart. Uh, so those people will, at the end, God will say, right, well done, good and faithful servant, to borrow from Matthew. He will he will evaluate and do this publicly, right? Everybody can see it. Um, and then those are the people who will be involved in the rest of the victory over sin when God actually defeats it, totally knocks it out of creation and condemns it. Um, so I, I take this to mean hold to be in the right, and I take it to be the sort of like end point uh, of the contention. Now, justify here doesn't... I don't think involve or entail um, the like things like forgiveness of sins or reconciliation because it's retrospective. If it's final judgment, he's looking back on their life. He's not making something new to make a sort of new life for them, right? As his friend, they've been, they've been that. Um, so here I would just gloss it as right. Hold to be in the right, right? Or, or consider righteous. Um, but it still, in my view, fits within the contention scenario. It just fits at the end. Right. right? Right, and it will entail vindication because it's the ones who are righteous before God, at the end, who will also be resurrected, right? Who will be raised incorruptible um, in an in an eternal life like Christ has, right? And will of course participate in the things that Christ has as the Son, who is the Judge and the King, like judging, defeating Satan, etc. Um, right. So it, it can entail vindication, but again, I'd see this here as through the evaluation. Okay, let's just go over then. Um, I just want to do. Romans three twenty four and Romans four five. So so, um, 
and then we'll just do it in light of what you said in Romans 2.13. So, okay, so you said um, in this context, right? So, 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 and, and people have noted this as well, right? That this is a future context, right? And that, that actually might be significant for how we understand the verb, right? I mean, if, if the verb is past, um, then it's an action that God has done previously, right? Um, but, but you cannot say, or no one can say they are justified in the sense of Romans 2.13, because that hasn't happened yet. Um, and so whatever that, sense- That would actually which you, be the opposite of what Romans 2 is telling you to do. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Like, you want to be justified at the end. This is what you should do in order to be justified at the end, right? Um, that's the idea. You, and, and, you know, obviously Romans 2, 6 through 11 spells out the same thing. Um, yeah, I think in, in more detail. But so, so then the idea here is that the word, even the adjective righteous, it is necessary that you would be morally righteous in order to get the correct or the, the verdict that you want. It, it, yeah, it, it, it here it, it means more innocent in the sense that you you are on the right side, right? At the verdict. You are so because you were morally righteous. Um, but the point here is that God is making this verdict about your state. And and you know, because people have read this, say, okay, well, this is kind of like a um, you know. You're righteous because of the righteousness of Christ, right? And so um, you it doesn't have to be your righteousness that makes you righteous. <laughs> um, but but you, you, so the way you're reading it, though, is this sort of um, verdict of you are righteous or you are not righteous is a real verdict in the sense that um, it is based on human behavior, basically. Yeah, it's. Oh, I could say it maybe in a in a, in a slightly different way um, without the the verdict language. That it's it's not contrafactual, right? right. It's, it's he's not he's not holding you to be in the right despite the fact that you're not, right? Um, uh, that's right. And I um, well, we can get we can we can get to this in in three twenty four. Um, but but yeah, that's right. It's 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 looking backward and it's evaluative, and this is farther on. This is stuff in the in the new book, not in the old book. That's just about the verb. Um, but um, I mean, I, I feel, I feel like the, um, some of the, some of the ways it gets presented, right. Of like, like, like my, my righteousness versus Christ's righteousness. Um, I feel like that's a, that's a metaphysical problem. Um, and, 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 and I think because of the, my the view of, of what is right. Um, uh, I, I think it's an error. Um, and I described this a bit in, in the new book. Um, but it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't come necessarily in, in the, in the word, but, um, uh, I mean, I, I because these people in Romans two, I who who will be vindicated, right? I think are in fact believers, uh, and I think that because of the gift language in Romans three and five, and because of the Holy Spirit fulfilling the law in them language in Romans eight, not despite it, um, right. right? That 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 well, if if what God wants to do is uh, make you His friend, and not just in the sense that you're enrolled on a sheet that says friends, but that also that, that that's actually happening in you, right? That you actually, as Paul, Paul describes it, right? Right. What God has prepared for those who love him, that the spirit actually works in you to make you love God. Right. And in a way that, that, that you couldn't without the spirit, um, uh, then, then, uh, then the righteousness that you have is Christ's righteousness through the spirit. And it's also yours. Um, right. because, uh, and, and as Augustine says this explicitly, right. He says it, it's, it's, it's his because it doesn't come from you and it's always his because it's always from him. And yet it's also yours, right? Because God is not a great gift giver. If the gift that he gives you doesn't become yours, <laughs> right? Uh, if I can put it really, really, uh, uh, briefly. Um, but that's, a again, that's, that, that's not about Dick. Ayo, that's about what we think is true right um and how we think paul would would think about it and how how to connect the dots between different things that he says um in our theology anyway yeah do, so uh, go ahead yeah so 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 we have this meaning um and 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 like we've already said like it's not necessarily i should, I should say this interpretation in romans 2 right of this verb um so it's not necessarily the case that in every time we encounter this verb we have this interpretation so I, I, let's let's go to Romans three 
24. And, and honestly, I mean, I, I know what you say about Romans 4, 5, and I can't remember if you really meant to talk about Romans 3, 24 as much. This is obviously, you know, every single word in this verse is, you know, debated. Um, but, you know, in this whole paragraph, honestly. But the, just, you know, dikaiumenoi dorean te autu kariti. So, um, being justified, and I, I just, I, I don't even want to translate it, but, um, you know, dorean, right? Like, as a gift, right? Te autu kariti, by his grace. That's just like the normal sort of translation. So, so, um, and, and then it's, you know, um, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, right? Um, dia tes apolutros eos tes en Cristo Jesu. So the, again, I, I think all of these are actually important for our understanding of the verb, you know, the, or the, the participle here. Um, but, but without getting into all of <laughs> everything involved in this verse, how, how, how do we understand this? And, and I mean, the, the, the previous verse as well is actually very important, you know, for all, it's, it's, usually translated for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God or are lacking the glory of God. Um, and then we have being justified, right? So so how do we, given this context of sin, lacking God's glory, what is dikaiumenoi doing here? Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, the, so the word itself I take to be framed, again, in that kind of interpersonal scenario where somebody's done wrong to the other, right? So God and you, um, and God's contention against sin, and then your your involvement in that when you're under sin, right? So all have sinned and are lacking, right, uh, the glory of God, which of course would be restored in Romans five, right, by hope through justification. Um, and then dikaiumeno here, uh, I take again to be like sort of um, uh, this isn't how you would translate the sentence with the participle, but just to frame the ideas, you have sinned, but or, and God justifies you which sound, seems contrary to what one would expect given that. Right? right. And and in this sense, God, your accuser, whom you have wronged, holds you to be in the right. right? Now, how does he do that? And then what does that go along with? Well, he does that as a gift. He does it by the operation of his charis, right? His grace. Um, and then also you notice the, uh, the apolutrosis, right? The, the redemption, right? And this is, this is, this is change of owner, change of master, right? Kind of language. So it fits along with me is another way of talking about what in the legal metaphor is changing sides, right? You've got a conflict between God and sin. You've been on sin side. You're under sin, right? Um, and as as you, by faith and, and the conversion and through grace are being justified, God holds you to be in the right because you've switched sides. But you're on God's side now. You're on the right side. There's only two sides in the whole thing, right? So... So in this case, then what you're saying is that the word means still means you are being held to be in the right, um, but it is you you are so because you have been redeemed and you have changed sides. Right, because through Christ and participation in Christ, which faith is part of, you have you've changed sides, and then the the just back in the legal thing about like, well, what do we do about your sin? Well, that entails then right forgiveness, I think. And is part of the changing sides and therefore also reconciliation, um, which is another interpersonal metaphor that doesn't have to go in with the legal stuff, but it often does. Um, and I think, it, I think this is why in, say, Romans 5, 1 through 11, justification and reconciliation are really hard to tease out in some ways, right? They have yeah. the same basis, the same means, the same goals, the same results, right? Uh, uh, and they're all just sort of put right there next to each other. And I would put redemption there as well. Um Although less on the interpersonal, but more on kind of who who are you under, right? Which which set are you on? So is the redemption then a like the moral transformation from sins because you're going from sin side to God's side, right? And by virtue of you doing that, God can consider you righteous. If you didn't do that, God couldn't consider you righteous because you aren't, right? I mean, in the in in the sense of again going back to Romans two thirteen. You have to actually become righteous in order to God for God to consider you righteous, um, if it's not counterfactual. Yeah, right? this way. I, I I I try to steer clear of the becoming righteous language here, mostly just because people will will usually read into it like a total transformation that's immediate instead of the gradual one throughout our lives. 
Um, both, both, both John Wesley and Jonathan Edwards have really interesting things to say about the thief on the cross, right? Where they say, well, he's not, he's, he, Christ lets him into the kingdom, but he has repented. He just doesn't any, so he has in that sense, right? His faith, his new faith in Christ has been embodied in his works, even though he died 20 minutes later or less than that, right? Um, it's just that he didn't have the opportunity to do all these other things in saying yes to God or in rejecting God, right? If he had lived on for another 30 years, we would have to evaluate him the way that we evaluate the Corinthians, right? Where like, right. yes, you've taken God's side, you've been baptized, you've, you've, you've repented, you've called God right, you've confessed, and, and you've received Jesus Christ in the joy of the wonderful gospel. And then the next day, when God put an opportunity to love somebody or be faithful in front of you, you, you know, uh, spat on it, and then you ran off and did something wicked that you were redeemed from. And so now we got to talk about like, hey, watch out. Right? Um, uh, so so in, in, in one sense, the way that I like to talk about it is that someone's faith is embodied in their repentance, their confession of sins or whatever. Um, uh, uh, and that that's true at the beginning, even when all you're doing is saying, sorry, right? Or Jesus, I believe you, right? I trust you and I need your salvation. All, all the way to the end when your faith has to be embodied in lots of other ways, right? Um, Abraham is faithful in Genesis 15. You know, he believes God and is counted to him as righteousness, even though he doesn't have a whole bunch of other stuff to bring with him, right? He's still ungodly in that way. Um, but if Abraham comes to Genesis 22 and God says, hey, do this with your son, right? Okay, there's all kinds of big questions about that, but leaving those aside, right? If Abraham goes, nah, I don't have to, right? Presumably God wouldn't say, good job. You trust me just by faith, right? <laughs> right. Your right. faith has to keep being embodied depending uh, in the next situation, the next moment. Um, and, and I think that that's happening uh, here. And I wouldn't put that weight onto Dikaiao, even though I think it fits with it. And I wouldn't put all that weight onto Apollutris either in Romans 3.24. I put it all on the thing that Paul seems to think is the core of what's going on in all of his salvation metaphors, which is that they've res- they, they dwell within Christ by the Holy Spirit. And Christ dwells in them. And that's transformative. Um, I don't know how the spirit who's meant to, right, like give you life can be in you. And, you know, we can say that, oh, that's totally separate from everything that you do in your life. Um, that's another conversation. Again, that, that's, in, that's in the new book. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, so I, so I think that that's what's going on because of participation, um, and then Dick Ayao indicates one important aspect of this because the because of the the, the backdrop of sin, right, and guilt, um, right. So it entails forgiveness. It's going to be part of reconciliation, or or, or entail it as well on the other side. And then uh, apolutrosis, I would take as being right an image for God, right, removing you Himself from that other side and then onto His own, right. Um, right. Repenting and turning can say the same kind of thing from the sort of human perspective or faith, right. Well, like I, 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 I was, I, I did put, put stock in all of these things over here that are evil when I was under sin. And now I put stock in Jesus Christ, right? And I hear him and I listen to him and I follow the heating of the spirit. So is this counterfactual here? I mean, so I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out because in, in Romans 2.13, right? It's very obvious. It's very, it's very easy to say that it isn't because it's the final judgment. It's all according to works, yada, yada, yada. So, um, here, though, given that it is something that people have now, right, the the question would be like, like when God is saying, in your view, like if this word me just means consider righteous, right, like at its core, are these people righteous? Because they aren't, right? If 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 it's pre, if they're they've sinned, and you know lack God's glory and then for God to consider them righteous would be counterfactual right unless 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 the you know sort of redemption piece happens first right um at least at least logically and then God can say oh well now you are righteous because you're on my side does that make sense yeah, absolutely. So I so I think that there's a lot of room here, right? Where where we're teasing out really important but really really kind of nuanced things, right? In the kind of logic of how this works, and Paul usually just sort of throws them all at you. Um, so I don't want to be overly dogmatic, except when I'm being dogmatic. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, 
Um, but but for for me, dogmatically, right? Speak, speaking speaking theologically, right? Not merely describing the, the words on the page, but describing what I how I think it all fits together. Um, uh, my I've moved slightly on this um, uh, in the last you know eight years, and I think that the best way to read it is that um, uh, that they are righteous because their past sins have been forgiven and. Their and Christ's righteousness, the righteous Christ is in them, right? Even if it hasn't worked itself out yet in all of the ways that you would like to sort of tally up someone's righteousness, right? The way that Job does uh, when he just sort of lists off all his, I did all of these things, right? And still I'm, um, I read Job yesterday for a, this other book, um, uh, right? When Job sort of lists off all the things that he did, he paid people their wages. He was good to the poor and foreigner. He was good to the poor. He, you know, didn't look at a woman, all those kind of things, right? Um, right, you don't you don't have that the moment that you convert, right? You've you've got you've got all of your past there, um, but 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 when you convert, right, and certainly when you move your feet to receive baptism, um, right, you're you're turning away from those to God. Um, so you need to have them forgiven because they're still there, um, and yet at the same time, right, in in a lot of language from the Old Testament, right, you are righteous because you've repented, right. So think about Ezekiel eighteen, right. Somebody who lives their whole life in justice, and then they turn and they follow sin, right? Well, the past justice doesn't doesn't help them anymore. Right. The same thing the other way, right? Um, uh, and that's just thinking about right the counterfactual. The other, the the most important thing I think is that uh, uh, who who is the righteousness of God? According to First Corinthians one, is Jesus, right? Um, and by the Holy Spirit, if He dwells in you. Right then, then his righteousness is in you and is going to work itself out and and work to move your will and your mind and transform you. That that's going to take a while to like set in uh, in different ways and to become visible to everybody, but it's there. So in this case, in one sense, right, it's still not counterfactual. It 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 is maybe counterintuitive. Right, because what the person is standing there with, right, who's come for baptism, right, is just all of their baggage, right, and a plea that God would have mercy. Um, but asking God for mercy is something the righteous do when they've sinned. When they haven't sinned, what they do is they keep not sinning, right. But when they have sinned, what the righteous, as opposed to the ungodly, do is they turn toward God in faith and they ask for mercy, right, and they receive the mercy that God gives instead of saying. You know what? I don't like that. I'd like to be saved a different way, right? So think about Romans 10, 2 to 3, right? And submitting to the righteousness of God as it's been revealed in Christ, right? You don't tell God he saved you the wrong way, so go off, right? What you do is you submit with all your baggage, um, and that is the beginning um, uh, or first step as um, Hans Joachim Ivan, he's a Lutheran theologian, um, he says this is the first step of faith, Right, is this confessing your sins and turning to God, uh, and in that sense, it's also the first step of transformation and righteousness, right? Which is done by God through the Holy Spirit in you. But in terms of your your side of things, right, that's your that's your first step. Um, so, we're a field from the lexicography here, right? But right, again, like if the question is like, is the is the verb is the is is the righteousness that God considers in them counterfactual? The answer is on the one hand, yes, obviously, because they've sinned, they fall short of the glory of God, and now God is justifying them, which is counter expectation. Is it utterly counterfactual, meaning that they have nothing that can be considered righteous at all? Right? No, I don't think so. I think that the I think that the repenting and most importantly, right, the spirit within, right, means that there's something in them to consider righteous, even if it hasn't been worked out in all the opportunities that they have to be faithful or not. Um, so I I. I um, I think, and I'm, I'm not positive about this, and then we can move on to Romans 4 um, after you respond to this, but, you know, so one of the things going on in my head is, is um, you know, Kincaid and um, Petrie's work, Paul, a new kind of Jew. Is there a third? Michael Barber is. Michael Barber. I knew, I knew there was. He's, and I, he's two, he's about 20 feet from me in his office over there. <laughs> okay, so maybe we should just ask him, but, but, but I, my, so, my understanding of what they're saying is, you know, the the righteousness is, um, you know, referring to a real righteousness that comes about through. I mean, it's it's a very you know sort of Augustinian reading of make righteous, right? Um, so why not? It, I mean, it, it it feels like in this context, um, 
you have to you have to have that at least entailed right or implied depending on how you view it um and and depending on how you define those terms but why not say that in this context it means make righteous like so so god you know redeems through jesus christ um and that means you know you're transferred from one side to the other and therefore you are made you know differently <laughs> you're you're um morally transformed by that and then yeah that, that doesn't necessarily again not meaning that it, it should always be interpreted that way but here um i feel like i feel like what you're saying and maybe i'm wrong here is that you have to have that in this context but it's not coming from that word is that right basically yeah so i i want to distinguish the reality from the of what's going on in the whole thing of what god is doing which we can see from like all of paul right and what he thinks about this sure i want to distinguish the reality from the particular metaphor and i want to do it for two reasons um which we can totally agree with right i I'm, i mean i'm 100 percent on your page what i'm wondering is can the word mean that in this context given that we have sinners you know and then and what what do we do with them to you know consider them righteous or make them righteous yeah that's right i mean and it's it's worth remembering that even somebody with as traditional a view as as as, as rudolf boltmann on on this um he still will say you can understand it to mean make righteous but what he means is it just means make righteous in status right so he, right. the, the language doesn't bother him, right? Um, and so I, I, I get nervous about the glosses sometimes. Um, sure. Uh, but um, my my reasons for wanting to distinguish are, um, uh, uh, for, I mean, first first of all, right? I, I want I want all the things to be able to play their role. So uh, and in this case, right? I don't I don't think that the dikaiao word is where all of the make righteous stuff is coming from, right? Uh, because again, it's not simply make righteous, right? It's have the righteous Christ dwell within you and begin to move your will in ways that will be esteemed righteous before God, right? It's not It's it's not like, oh, this word also can mean this. And here seem, sure seems like we've got an extra, right? The, the other reason that I get nervous about it is because, um, because it's such a weird word and it doesn't seem... Uh, there's a couple of places where people are like, oh, maybe here, but it really doesn't seem to be used for make righteous in that kind of way to me any, anywhere else. Um, uh, you can maybe argue that in a couple of places, but I, I just don't, I don't see it. Yeah. There are like a handful of places where it's like. Mm. And very small, right? And they're not in the context that Paul deliberately cites or I think echoes when he's talking about it. So again, I, I just don't think that in, in his mind, that word is taken on that sort of fullness. I, I, again, I do see that in the reality, right? But I also don't want to read into Dikaio like purchase, right? Which would come in with like, with redemption here, with right, right. Okay, like that's, it's not the same. And, but the other, the other reason is, right, again, so those are kind of like negative ones. The positive one is, I think that Paul is still actively working with this metaphor, Right, this sort of like because I, I, I think he, I think he brings it out um, at certain places. I think it's, I think it's a clear kind of, um, it's something that he clearly assumes and is sort of working out of when he talks about justification. Um, uh, and I think he keeps doing that. Um, and so for that reason, I don't. Uh, uh, even though I think that's going on, I'm not sure that that's in any of the uh, any of the specific verbs even in 24 or the verbal noun with apolutrosis. Um, uh, I think that he, I think that you can see it when, for instance, in Galatians two, right. And three, he moves from here's how it went with me and Peter. Right. And even we believe in Jesus Christ, despite being circumcised right by nature, right. Not G Gentile sinners. Right. But we received Jesus. Uh, we put faith in Jesus Christ and we have, uh, uh, righteousness comes through him, not through the law. And we know that you stupid Galatians, you already received the Holy spirit, right? That, that puts justifying and receiving the Holy spirit right at the same moment. It doesn't mean that the, that justify means give Holy spirit, right? Be justified means receive Holy spirit as a word, but it means that the, the, that the two go together in his theology. And so, so with that, right, I see 
uh, I, I see I see those two things coming in with each other directly. The same way that that I think Romans four brings forgiveness in, right? Reckoning righteousness and not reckoning sin with Dikaiao, right? Um, in in a, in a really similar way. But I think the the sort of core of his theology is the participation and the transfer. And then with that, of course, comes all kinds of metaphors that indicate a transfer and relate to certain things, right? Redemption and freedom and slavery redemp- re- relate to who's over you and who do you owe allegiance to. Justify relates to right. How are you? How are you seen? What side are you on in this contention? Right? Have you have you re- have you returned to God or are you still against Him? Reconciliation very close there. Are you still standing as His enemy or have you been brought over to be His friend? Um, uh, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So I, so I, I really take the reception of the spirit, um, uh, and being in Christ to be the kind of core thing that makes somebody go from not saved to saved, right. Or living with the hope of salvation. And then all of these other things, right. Are able to, to sort of hit different aspects of that and relate to different kind of parts of that new life. And he can bring some up here where it's appropriate or some up here where it's appropriate or throw them all together because they all go together. Um, I, I think, but I still want to, I still want to keep, I still want to retain kind of hold in the right for Dick Iao, um, because I, th- I think that's what it brings to the table, even though what's happening behind the words that are in Romans three twenty four is that reception of the spirit, which is uh, uh, what we could say in one sense is a making righteous, but we could also say a conforming to Christ, right? Or a, right, growing in faithfulness or a, like all of these different kinds of things, or like more technically, again, using language from Philippians too, like God moving your will and empowering right. activity. Well, that's not making righteous, even though the things that you're going to do when you obey him are righteous, Right, but it's not it's not sort of like set against that particular backdrop or that question as far as as far as I understand it. I could be wrong. Right. I got friends who think I'm crazy and think I should just translate make righteous most of the time, and, and I think that's wrong. But <laughs> and they think you're wrong. Check with me the next decade. Who knows? You know. Right. <laughs> right. So so just a last question. I think I think this is um, you know, from the title of your book, this is kind of where where it's coming from right romans 4 um and 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 this is one of the things that um yeah i mean i I think i think like the the idea of forgiveness and you know justification is obviously very central in um when we're talking about abraham right um so romans 4 2 you know if abraham was justified right Ex ergon, right? So, so the from, and again, this is like all kinds of debate about what that, what that's referring to. <laughs> um, but you know, um, if he is, then then he has you know something to boast about, kalkema, um, you know, but not towards God. So, so what what is justifying? Obviously, in this context, um, you have very very clear, um, you know, sort of uh, consider language, right? Um, you know, like, um, you know, his, his faith is considered right? Um, so how does this fit in? And, and I, as a part of this question, how is this different? Um, how is your view different from the sort of just like traditional Protestant interpretation, right? If, if you're going to say, you know, as a, as a Catholic, your, your friends and your, and your little space are all wrong right and augustine was wrong um and it's just forgiveness right how are you different than luther um and 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 and, but really just help us understand paul here like um why does he use these kinds of words here for forgiveness where really in romans 2 um you know the caotheus one tie was not forgiveness right it was it was clearly not um you know you're now forgiven it's because it was at the final judgment. So, so I know that's a big question, but this is your, just basically answer however you want. Um, so yeah, go ahead and take a stab at Romans four and two and, and, and how it relates to three. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's worth, it's worth me saying um, for the sake of my colleagues and, and, and maybe what people think of me, um, uh, 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 the, the new, the new book is just chock full of quotations from Augustine, right? Cause I think he's right about what's happening. I just think he would, glo- I think he glossed the word incorrectly. Right. Right. 
right. same same thing with these other folks. And 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 um, uh, Luther Melanchthon is really interesting when he writes the Apology for the Augsburg Confession, um, 1530, 1531. Um, uh, he actually is getting into the justification uh, issue in Article Four, and he says, "Yes, it's, it's primarily the forgiveness of sins." And it also can mean make righteous or make alive or these other things. He says, scripture speaks both ways, right? But what we're trying to do is figure out what's really going on and what people need to know, like their salvation rests on or not, right? Um, uh, um, uh, and anyway, and, and the Council of Trent, uh, session six, this is chapter seven, um, uh, has gone through all of its stuff on justification. And again, they're reading all soteriology, not the verb, right? Um, cause that's the umbrella term for salvation at this point. And it's of course, like Luther's using that one too. So they are too. Um, but, but Trent says, right. Justification consists not merely in the forgiveness of sins, right. But also in the transformation of the inner person, right. Unto the final judgment, um, and reconciliation going from an enemy to a friend going from unjust to becoming just right. Um, uh, so I, so the, the new, the new book is actually very Tridentine, despite the fact that given my reading of the verb, <laughs> you might not expect that at all. Um, uh, uh, but I, so in Romans four, right. Paul has been using Dikaio, right. Already. And now he's going to jump to a scriptural proof text. Um, and he goes to one that doesn't use that verb, but uses related language, right. That joins righteousness and faith where God reckons righteousness to Abraham. Uh, and then he moves from there to say, right, the same blessing that Abraham received when God considered him righteous or reckoned righteousness to him when he believed, right, not given anything else, right, but for that reason, um, uh, that's parallel to David saying, blessed is the one whom God doesn't reckon sin. So, so in this case, right, it seems to me that he's, again, looking at that sort of beginning moment right of faith he's asking what what the grounds are for it how it's uh, the, uh how it's received right um uh works or or faith right pistis um uh and so he jumps to abraham to make his point and in the course of doing so right he kind of equates right justification right dikaioo with reckoning righteousness with not reckoning sins right and atoning for sins so i i i take it in this passage that the sort of primary frame is you, like Abraham, were ungodly, and God justifies you, and that's counter-expectation. Um, he justifies you, he holds you to be in the right, and that entails forgiving your sins. There's a whole lot more that justification entails, right? But in this passage, what he's pointing to is, right, how do you, how, 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 how do you receive what you're receiving? It's by faith. Same thing with Abraham, right? Even though Abraham doesn't receive the Holy Spirit in the same way, he doesn't, all that stuff is different post-Pentecost, I think, right, in the New Covenant. And I think Paul would say the same thing given other passages where he talks about, right, the law and grace with the Spirit, um, right? But the but the parallel is there, right, that what you're coming to the table with is, uh, well, your sins and your faith, right? And for that, God reckons righteousness and unreckons your sin. Um, and you can see this really interestingly in the book of Jubilees, for which I had to learn Ethiopic, Ge'ez. And it really disappointingly only showed up on one page of the dissertation. <laughs> but it took me months. I uh, actually did appreciate the uh, Ge'ez, you know, like like the real reference to it, you know, not just like... Yeah. There's another book that that gets into this and it says, I should be looking at this, you know, at, at Jubilees as well, because there's language about this, but I, but I don't know Ethiopic. And I was like, <laughs> you can't publish that in a dissertation? Right? Like... So I didn't have time to actually answer the question that I'm asking. Like, right, right. Is, anyway, so <laughs> just leave it out. <laughs> it's probably just my pride, right? Um, uh, 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 coming out, but but anyway, so I did that. Um, but but Jubilees is really interesting because it explicitly right moves the reckoning and non-reckoning language into the big contention language, which is also explicit in Jubilees. Um, uh, uh, which so it again kind of matches up with all this stuff. But yeah, so this is this is Abraham, or right, primarily the Christian, right? And we're proving it through Abraham because it's written for our instruction uh, for Paul. Right, this is Abraham standing before God and believing in God without a whole bunch of other stuff, right? With with, with sins, right? Being ungodly generally, um, and uh, uh, receiving forgiveness and being held to be in the right by God. Um, now Paul's going to move on in Romans five to bring in right the reconciliation aspect that comes on with the forgiveness. And, and all that, again, I think fits into the interrelational dynamics of the contention, right? Where you don't think about God sitting behind a bench as judge 
and just sort of checking, you know, checking his boxes and then saying, okay, how can I find a way to make you not guilty? Um, but, but God actually standing in front of you and you standing in front of God and God saying, you've sinned and you're saying, yeah, I know, I'm sorry. And God saying, come home, right? It's much more prodigal son. It's much more Luke 15 uh, in that way. Um, but again, it's happening by means of the reception of the spirit, right? And the conversion of the heart. And so it brings with it lots of other things. Um, and at the end of the whole thing, we'll bring with it, right? A, a God's positive evaluation of you and your life of faith. Um, uh, and also right, vindication and resurrection, because the work of the spirit received is to conform you to Christ in his righteousness, in his identity as son, in his um, uh, ultimately in his incorruptibility. Um, so all of that, all of that is happening. Right? It's a very kind of, if I could put it this way, without offending too many people, it's a very baptismal soteriology and receiving forgiveness um, and being held to be in the right by God is a really important part of that when you know you're coming before him with a bunch of sins, right? That's good news. Um, if you look at it from the perspective of I'm fallen and corruptible and subject to the flesh, right? Then, right, the good the good news follows a different line, right? Justification is still good news, but also we need the transformation, right, to speak that good word to us there. But when you're, right, looking at all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, what do we want? Or you were enemies of God uh, in Romans 5, well, what we what 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 matches that right? The metaphor that matches that is justification from the one that you wronged, right? Which entails forgiveness and reconciliation. Um, so that's in these kind of passages. That's how I sort of understand the the verb, and it's happening in view of the final judgment, uh, but it's happening now, right? In your relationship with God, who is the Almighty Judge, and also your father and friend that you've run away from. Well, I think we should just stop there because that that's actually i mean i i mean i'm really i i think the you can get into endless detail about what these words mean um but but they actually have meaning you know and i think that's a an important thing not to forget when you're trying to figure out what they're saying um is that this actually is a beautiful story and you've laid it out for us really beautifully um so i'm i'm really excited about your your book um so i mean um, you said it's coming out early 2023. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so we'll have to, um, you know, watch out for that, but just really th- appreciate all of the, you know, careful scholarship. I mean, I think that's one thing if, if you, for anyone that reads your work, you know, very careful about, um, you know, just all the detail and, and, and that is what needs to be done. <laughs> you know I mean? Especially in this kind of debate about what, what these words mean when they're so picked over, um, yeah, I just think it's it's really, uh, really great work, and highly recommend to anyone. Um, you have any closing thoughts? Um, well, number one, I, I really appreciate that, and the uh, uh, the new book has a citation to uh, the linguistic case for the third view by <laughs> Kevin Grosso. <laughs> there you go. So, are are you, are you agree with me on the third view? Because I, <laughs> I, I think I think we should have a longer conversation, but <laughs> but but, but lar- largely yes, right? Largely yes, yeah. Um, uh, and I don't, I don't, I don't, ac- I don't accidentally want to put, I don't want to like say what I say and then say, we agree. And then accidentally put words in your mouth. Cause you are also doing very careful work. So what I'd rather do is sit on the other side of this bench and then just have you talk to me about <laughs> and, and, and walk through it for everybody. But no, yeah. I, uh, but I, I, I take it. I really appreciate your work, um, uh, on that and some other, some other folks who've, who've argued for a kind of third view. Um, but also, um, uh, and I think Jeanette Hagen Pfeiffer's dissertation on faith under John Barclay has been really helpful to just sort of recontextualize the value in Paul for human faith um, and its participatory relation to Christ, right? Whether you want to call it Christ's pistis or, or whatever, right? In, in, in Paul's phrasing um, that, that I think, I think, I think, I think bet- between, between the two of those, uh, it, it's a really nice one, two punch um, uh, conceptually to help reframe some of the some of the debates, um, because it just gets, it gets nuts as you know, right? Yes. Um, the- <laughs> yes. It has, it has gotten nuts for sure. So, but yeah, I mean, and this is great. I mean that we have, you know, new work coming out, um, you know, that, that is, is trying to move some of these, you know, conversations forward. Otherwise, thank you very much. This is actually, um, uh, 
it's not the first media thing that I've done, but I think this is my first technical podcast and this has been really pleasant. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate the very fact that you've read anything that I've written at all, which, you know, one always, you know, it's, you, you just never know. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, that's all we have time for on this episode of the Biblical Languages podcast. Thank you, Jim, for joining us. Thanks so much, Kevin. And thank you to all of our listeners out there who have taken the time to listen to the Biblical Languages podcast brought to you by Biblingo. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Thank you for listening to the Biblical Languages podcast brought to you by Biblingo. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app and leave us a review. You can also follow Biblingo on social media to discuss the episode with us and other listeners. And don't forget to visit biblingo.org to start your 10-day free trial of Biblingo.